Lord God, we are grateful. We are grateful for your presence in our lives. <coughs> Lord, help us to see with your eyes. Help us to see that in spite of how much struggle and pain and violence and darkness is in this world, that your light, your good, your love, your hope is still here in this world. And help us to know that, that your love will be victorious. Help us to live with hearts of gratitude, living into that presence, the presence of all of your goodness, your presence that we saw in Jesus, a presence that loved, a presence that cared, a presence that healed, a presence that listened, a presence that included all those who have been left out. Help us, Lord, to see and to realize everything that, that Jesus came to show us is a possibility for our lives to live in that hope, to live in that love, to live in that place where things are being made right and we are being empowered to turn the world right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we have been looking at gratitude these last couple of weeks, and we'll continue to look at gratitude in the upcoming weeks for another week or two. Uh, gratitude, I think, is so important to our spiritual life. As a matter of fact, I think gratitude is the posture that someone who believes in all of the wonderful, incredible things that we claim that Jesus did, that our God does, we go through life with gratitude because we have a sense of how good God is. So let me ask you this question. Are you a grateful person? If you are a grateful person, raise your hand. If you see yourself as a grateful person, raise your hand. All right, let me ask you this. What does a grateful person look like? Anybody, what does a grateful person look like? Anybody got some idea? A grateful person. What does a grateful person look like? Someone who doesn't complain. Someone who doesn't complain. Okay. Yeah, they, they end up, instead of complaining, they end up doing something about what needs to be dealt with. Right. Okay. What does a grateful person look like? Anybody? Anybody else? Yeah, what is a grateful person? Someone who's always looking for what's right and not what's wrong. Yes. As their mental focus. Their mental focus is on the positive, not the negative. Absolutely. What's good in this world, not what's screwed up. It doesn't mean that they're not aware of what's screwed up in the world. It's just not their focus. Well, and, and they know that if they focus on what's screwed up, they're going to be, they're not going to be able to be bringing that positive into the world. Because we want to be bringing the positive into the world to change what's negative about the world. Anybody else? What does a, a, a grateful person look like? What are some adjectives that you would use to describe a grateful person? Yes, Joseph. Someone who appreciates them. Appreciate. Someone who appreciates. Any other but because I'm not grateful and complain a lot, I see a person who's not grateful as somebody who's you know. Yeah, okay. 
bad yeah. Just, lemon juice. Here I am to judge you. Yeah, I'm saying I'm not grateful person. And don't judge yourself, okay? Quit judging yourself now. So, uh, uh, yeah, okay. A grateful person is thankful. A grateful person is appreciative. You know, a grateful person has some level of being content. You know, a grateful person is pleased. A grateful person is positive. Uh, a, a grateful person is, is a joyful person. But here's one I want you to ponder. I contend that a grateful person is also filled with awe and wonder at life. A grateful person is expectantly waiting for God to do something wonderful because they know God is going to do something wonderful because a person with a grateful mindset has been able to see what God has been doing wonderful and knows that God is not going to change and God is going to continue to do wonderful things in this world. Doesn't that sound good? Doesn't that sound great to have that kind of mindset? You know, wouldn't you love to be feeling all the time how wonderful, how wonderful this life is, you know, and, and have a sense all the time how good, how good things are. What would your life look like if someone described you as a, a, a grateful person. If, if, well, let me say that. Someone, what, if everyone described you as a grateful person, you know, you know I, I, I bet they, they, would, they would go down the street and they'd see you and they would say, oh, there's Eleazar over there. And Eleazar, you know, he's always so thankful. He's, you know, he's thankful for the gifts that are, are, are that come to him, and he makes me feel good when he appreciates his thankfulness. Oh, and 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 and, and there's Maggie over here. You know, Maggie will pay attention to you. Maggie won't ignore you. When when you come into a room, Maggie will say, "Oh, how you doing?" And she'll come up to, you, and you'll feel like. Wow, I haven't been ignored. Maggie knows I'm here. And it makes you feel good. Or, 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 or somebody will say, there's Barbara. <coughs> what a thankful person. If there is a person that carries around an attitude of gratitude, it's Barbara. And you know, I want some of that to rub off on me. I want to be around her. Let me ask you this. Why is it important to you to be grateful. Why is it important to be grateful? Have any ideas? Yeah. Gratitude makes you happy. You can't, you can't be happy if you're ungrateful. That's right. You know, it's like the gatekeeper to happiness. Yeah. That unlocks the door. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, you know, why is it important to you to to to, to be grateful. Anybody have any ideas? Why is it important to be grateful? Anybody? Uh, let's go back here. I think because God gives us so much and He wants us to praise Him and to give Him thanks for what He's given us. So having that attitude really helps. Okay, it's important to return, return. thanks for, uh, for the gifts that have been given to you. And I'd like to take that one step further. It's important to be aware that gifts are being given to you. And they're being given to you all the time. And if you can just be aware of that, man, what a difference that would make. Barb, why is it important to be grateful? Because if you're not, you pull other people down. Yeah. I want to avoid pulling other people down. We've right. got enough to deal with. That's this. Right, right. Grateful people are joyful people. Yeah, okay. Grateful to have friends. Grateful to have friends. Great, Walter. Thank you. You know, uh, uh, grateful people are joyful people. Grateful people are people, believe it or not, grateful people have more support in their lives. Grateful people, statistics show, even tend to live longer. Research shows 
that people who express, express gratitude are happier and more optimistic with a stronger immune system and emotional connections than those people that aren't grateful. Grateful people know how to manage stress of, the, of daily living in a better way. Research shows that gratitude builds resilience. You know what resilience is? Gratitude builds resilience. And what resilience is, is what? I said the ability to snap back. The ability to snap back, right. The, the ability to cope with what life brings you. Resilience is the, the, uh, is the ability to manage the stresses of life. And you know, life has stress. There's absolutely no ands, ifs, or buts, buts about that. To live in this life means we're going to experience stress and struggle and pain. That's what it means. But resilient people have the ability to manage that. Let me read you. I've been reading, I've just been sharing with you, I've been reading this book by Diana Butler Bass. It's called uh, Grateful. And uh, I want to read this paragraph to you. She says, When psychologists speak of resilience, they are referring to our capacity to grow into our best selves, to be healthy, creative, emotionally balanced, and mature people. So a grateful person who's growing into their resilience is someone who can, is growing to be healthy, creative, emotionally balanced, and mature. Positive emotions like gratitude foster resiliency, which strengthens our physical health, especially our heart health, and the ability to recover more quickly from illness and surgery. Thus, gratitude can actually create better outcomes in our future health. Resiliency also works to improve our psychological health. According to one study, resilient individuals reported fewer symptoms of depression and trauma following the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. Having a grateful disposition in advance of that national crisis gave some Americans better coping skills and helped them navigate those frightening and difficult days with fewer negative effects than their fellow citizens. Is that true? That's true. Let me, let me say this, because this is another important uh, point I want to make. Researchers discovered that positive emotions not only make people feel good in the present, but they also increase the likelihood that people will function well and feel good in the future and cause an upward spiral of well-being. If, if you have a sense of gratitude, that's going to help you grow in a sense of, of gratitude and, and, and move in an upward spiral of, of, of well-being. She concludes this paragraph with this sentence. Gratitude now anticipates increased positive emotions in the future. Gratitude now anticipates increased positive emotions in the future. If you can be aware of God's presence in your life right now, that's only going to build and help you get a stronger sense of God's presence in the future. Being grateful is a spiritual stance. To be grateful is to be in a, 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 a spiritual stance towards life. It's a way of, of choosing to live in the spirit rather than according to the world or the flesh. How many of you here know 
that the values of God are contrary to the values of the world. Can I get an amen? amen. The values of God are contrary to the values of the world. If we are following God, we are countercultural. We are going to be different than what we see acted out in the world. The bickering, the fighting, the division, you know. They're trying to get mine to take yours. If we're living by the values of God, we are going to be countercultural to what we see in the world. Paul calls it living in the flesh versus living in the spirit. You know, in Paul's understanding of the flesh, and he means more than just are physical. He means sort of a, an attitude, a mindset towards life. So he, he, he says, flesh is temporary. It dies. Flesh is focused on the self. Yet focus on the self, because we're in the flesh, is necessary for survival. So things like food and drink and sex and other pleasures of life are needed for our survival. And all that is a part of our human condition. Now we get cranky, we get fearful, we get anxious, and we feel all kinds of bad if we don't satisfy the needs of the flesh. And that can then lead to doing all kinds of bad things, real or perceived. Spirit, though, spirit is so different from the flesh. Spirit is eternal. Whereas the flesh dies, spirit brings life. Uh, we might feel scared and worried about death, but wonderful, uh, wonderful if we're focused on what brings life. Flesh is focused inward. Flesh is focused uh, on the self. Uh, whereas spirit is focused outward. Spirit is focused on God and on others. Whereas the flesh is limited and confined, the spirit is limitless and free. I want to read the scripture again from today. You heard from one translation. I'm from the J.B. Phillips, which is what Dale read earlier. I want to read to you now from the new, uh, uh, I think this is from the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's laws. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Gratitude is a doorway between the world of the flesh and the realm of the spirit. Gratitude is that doorway between, there is overlap between the world of the flesh and the world of the spirit, but gratitude is that doorway that gets us from one to the other. And it's not like we don't have gratitude in this life, in this fleshly existence. There's a lot of things I'm grateful for in our, uh, 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 the realm of the world, in our fleshly existence. But the sense of gratitude and what we have to be gra grateful for is so much greater in the world of the spirit. You know, Negativity cannot get us down and hold us down if we are feeling grateful. We know that every good gift comes from God, says James. What can we do 
to be grateful? What can we do to ensure that we are grateful now and, and that we will be grateful in the future? Uh, Diana Butler Bass wrote that gratitude now anticipates increased positive emotions in the future. What can we do to build habits of gratitude into our life, habits that will carry us into the future? What can we do that will ensure that we have the resiliency that will allow us to cope with life, with whatever life brings us. The resiliency of God's presence in your life. What can you do that will ensure that you will be that grateful person who builds that kind of resiliency? I think one of the things you can do is start with is to be grateful for the people in your life. Start with that. Be grateful for the people that are in your life. You know, I can't make it alone. I need family. I need Judy in my life. She's sitting out there in the hallway now. But, you know, I need people in my life. I need family. I need friends. I need you in my I need my church in my life. That helps me be a grateful person. Did you know that you cannot reach the destiny that God has in store for you without the people that God has put in your life to help you get there? You cannot reach the destiny that God has in store for you without the people in your life that God has put there to help you get there. That's the whole reason the church exists. That's why the church is here, to help us become that full person that God created us to be. And you know, it's a journey. We are moving towards that person that God created us to be. None of us have reached it yet. But I need you to help me on the journey to help me get there. And I hope you see that we need each other to be able to get there. Um, we need each other to comfort us when we're down. We need each other to encourage us when we're making the effort. We need each other to guide us when we have obstacles that we have to maneuver around. We need each other to remind us of the truth of the gospel, especially when we're in times of doubt. <coughs> what can you do to ensure that you will be a grateful person, building resiliency in your life? Well, I think there's a number of things. One of the things we have to do is to recognize that the world's way of doing things is not God's way of doing things. And we need to mold our mind in harmony with God's way. We need to recognize that God wants to mold us into the very image of Jesus Christ. And, and, and we have to, to set ourselves realizing that we are on this journey and we need to get to this place that God has for us. And, and well, let me say it this way. Paul says it this way from Romans 12. <clears throat> Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may listen to what, so you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. The typical way we think about molding our minds to, 
to, to be in harmony with God are things we've spoken about here. The importance of reading Scripture. Every time we read Scripture, we take in a little bit of, of, of the truth that is there in Scripture. And if we read Scripture daily, we begin to even understand it better and take it in at a deeper level. Because quite frankly, there's a whole lot of confusing stuff in Scripture. There's a whole lot of stuff that I see. What? But, you know, but we need to, to keep reading it and understand it, not in the context of just one verse here or one verse there, but the whole sweep of what is God doing? God's bringing about a new creation. God's working to transform us, to transform the world, you know, to, to be that glorious kingdom that we hear about also in the scripture. And we need to look and see uh, at, at how God does that. And the, the, the Bible is a history of God's response, excuse me, of the people's response. The Bible is a history of the people's response to God. And a lot of times the people aren't very faithful to God. Pastor Kerry? Sorry, we're not going to leave. I don't like leaving. That's all right. No problem. It's a wonderful I service that spoke to me today. All right. It's helped me. My life is living hell right now. I brought the Lord back to me every time. The rise of hope is a great place. I, well, I, hope, back. I hope you can take the presence of the Lord with you when you leave here okay. and come back. I will. I'll okay. Take care. All right. Um, scripture is. <coughs> is important. God speaks to us in the Scripture. Another way God speaks to us is through prayer. Um, and every time we pray, at least we're making an approach to God. You know, uh, we may not always be praying for the things that God wants, but you know, that's okay. Because God honors the fact that you're coming to God in prayer. And if you deepen your relationship with God in prayer and try to hear God, you're going to hear what God has to say to you as well. You're going to hear about God's great love for you. Everyone, no one is excluded from that love, that power of God. Another way that we, we mold our minds is, is by coming to worship and being a part of a service where we not only hear the word, but we uh, are lifted to places of praise where we can get to a place where it helps us try to get to that place of gratitude that we were talking about. Another way we do it is through fasting. Fasting is important because you're saying, I'm setting aside this time to really get serious about my spiritual life. And I'm going to use that fasting as a way of focusing in on what it is that God wants. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, also was very clear that another way we are molded into the likeness of Christ is through doing acts of mercy helping people that are in need. But if we do that, that has a way of not only helping the person in need, but transforming us into the loving, caring person that God actually created us to be. So I've been asking the question, what can you do to ensure that you will be a grateful person, a person who has resiliency in life to deal with all that life throws our way? Well, we can develop a spiritual mindset. You know, having a mind that sees the world as God sees the world and then acting on how God sees the world a world that in spite of the darkness, in spite of the negativity, in spite of the violence that we see in the world, you know, we also can see that the world is filled with incredible potential. You know, and that God has given us all the tools, everything that we need to be able to sashay right into that kingdom, to come into that kingdom with joy, and celebration. 
you know, to lift up all that God is doing and be grateful for that. And to look at every single person that comes into your life and see the image of God in that person. And that's important because the very reason you have life, the very reason anybody has life, is because God breathed that life into that person. And, and in the scriptures, breath and spirit and wind in both Greek and Hebrew are the same word. When God breathed his breath into us, he was breathing his spirit into us. The theologians from long before our day called that the Imago Deo. That's Latin for the image of God. That the image of God is in every single life. The problem is, too many of us cover it over. You know, we, 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 we try to let ourselves come out that wants me, my, mine instead of what God wants. So, um, the last two days, the last two days, Judy and I were at a, a, a workshop that was uh, led by the Reverend Brian Brown, who's the, the pastor at Woodlawn Faith up the road here. And, and the title of this workshop was Developing an Outward, Developing and Implementing an Outward Mindset. And uh, it was actually developed for corporations to help them learn how to be better and work together and get positive results in the industry. But, but Brian has uniquely transformed it into a spiritual workshop uh, that helps us get focused on what it is that God wants and to, be, uh, to have a spiritual mindset that is outward looking, uh, focused on God and focused on God's people and accomplishing what God wants us to do together in the church and in our communities. In an inward mindset, you are focused on yourself. In an inward mindset, you're focused on getting your needs. What, it is, what is it that you need? Uh, you know, and, and in an inward mindset, other people simply become objects to you. Uh, they become vehicles to help you get what you want. Uh, in an inward mindset, uh, if, if they're not a vehicle to help you get what you want, then they're an obstacle uh, that gets in the way of your getting what you want. And so then you therefore you either blame that person or become aggressive towards them. If you're uh, uh, inward looking, if people aren't a vehicle to get what you want or an obstacle to, in the way of getting what you want, they become irrelevant. You ignore them. They don't matter to you because you're not getting what you want. You know, an outward mindset, though, sees people as people. An outward mindset sees everybody as a creation of God. And in fact, an outward mindset sees the image of God in everyone. When I talked about him earlier, in the Imago Dei, in an outward mindset, everybody has value. And together, working together, we can help each other reach our appointed destiny. A person with an inward mindset, you know what they're going to do? A person with an inward mindset they're going to manipulate, and they're going to threaten, and they're going to control, and they're going to criticize, and blame, and punish, and ignore, and exclude, and belittle. But a person with an outward, spiritual mindset will realize that we can't achieve our destiny without each other and God. Therefore, the person with the outward mindset is going to set high expectations for themselves and others. And they're going to give real responsibility. They're going to challenge others to do their best in a positive, challenging 
way. They're going to give others helpful correction. They're going to give necessary feedback to each other. How are you doing in, 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 in if we're talking about becoming a disciple, how are you doing in, in becoming a disciple? person with an outward mindset will have necessary difficult conversations. You know there's people in our lives sometimes that we see just our, you know, uh, people in the church. We see they're keeping us from moving forward to becoming what it is that God wants us to be. Well, there needs to be a necessary but loving conversation with people like that to help them understand how to begin to, to move forward. A person with an outward mindset is really going to listen. You're going to know that a person with an outward mindset is listening to you, and you will see that they're learning from you. They're learning about you and what your concerns are and beginning to learn what you have to offer in getting us all to the destiny that God has for us. Person with an outward mindset is going to offer help and they're going to involve others. They're not going to do it all on their own um, because they think that they can do it the best. Unfortunately, that's my struggle. That's the box I'm in. And I've got to try to get out of that. I've got to have more of that outward mindset instead of that inward mindset. But a person with an outward mindset. It, 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 it is going to involve others because it's together is where we will reach the kingdom that God has in store for us. Um, they're going to show genuine appreciation. They're going to acknowledge their own mistakes. When they make a mistake, they're, they're going to admit it. And when someone tries to correct them, they're not going to fight the correction. They will listen and hear what that person is trying to say about correcting them. And they will hear what truth is there for them to, to take. These last two days in this workshop with Judy, I, I learned two things, two things that had made me realize. Actually, I learned that we have two choices. Um, first choice that we have is either we can try to go through life trying to satisfy our own individual and selfish needs. As most people do, they're going through life trying to satisfy their own needs. Uh, um, and I don't mean selfish in a, a pejorative way, but I mean they're focused on their self. Their wants. Their wants. And, and uh, most people are going through life trying to, to focus on those individual self-needs. And because of that, we're focused inward. Well, if we're focused inward, we're eventually going to end up in conflict with other people. Uh, and and it's, it's impossible not to end up in conflict if you're focused on yourself. But we have another choice. The other choice is that we can approach life with a spiritual outward mindset that is grateful for all the people that God has put in our lives because we recognize that every person has their own God-given gifts. And when we work with each other instead of against each other, we will help us all reach our destiny. There's a lot of work getting there. It's not as simple as seeing there's an inward mindset or an outward mindset. There's a lot of hard work of recognizing the ways that you block all of these positive notion, ways in life. The ways that, that uh, you respond to other people's negativity that is negative in the way you respond. Uh, there's a lot of work in trying to bring about positiveness, to getting in that outward mindset. But one of the ways to begin is just to start showing appreciativeness. To begin to just start 
to try to be as grateful as we can and show appreciation to one another. And it can be as simple as giving honest and real compliments to one another. Um, so, you know, how would uh, uh, you feel if I said to you, Dale, you know, I really appreciate your commitment to Rising Hope. You have been here through all of the years. You, you, you've been, I don't know how many years, 19, 20 some odd years you've been here at Rising Hope. You've raised two children here at Rising Hope. And, and you know, you show up and you give what you can. How does that make you feel, Dale? Well, I'll tell you that. It makes me feel awesome. Okay. Well, I, and, you know, and showing someone appreciation does make them feel awesome. They uh, 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 appreciate that. Marky, I'm so glad you came here to play music for us today. You know, I, I really appreciate it. It's something that, that's added to the music since our regular musicians and regular worship leaders not here today. You know, what you bring, you've helped fill the gap. And you've made it happen for us. Thank you so much, Marky. You know, um, uh, uh, Craig, I appreciate it. There are so many things that you do for Rising Hope. Oh, my goodness. And thank God you're willing to do them. And you, and you do them quietly without complaining. You're a behind-the-scenes kind of guy. You're the guy who makes things happen, you know, with your leadership on the finance committee, with your help with our, our technical stuff, with your dealing with our security and and all of those kinds of issues. You've been, you've been wonderful. I mean, you know, it, it, it's so good when we show, when we compliment each other. Complimenting, real compliments to one another are very important things to do. So I think if we really started the habit of complimenting one another, that we would see incredible gratitude grow here. We would see a sense of gratitude that people are going to start saying, I want to come to Rising Hope, because Rising Hope is a place where I am appreciated. Rising Hope is a place where, you know, they don't ignore me. They know who I am. And, and, and it feels good. And they're always celebrating. You know? you know, we call this the celebration center. We don't call this the worship center. This is the celebration center because we're celebrating what God is doing in our lives. So I have something that you can take on as a habit. And this, these are little complimentary pads, complimentary notes. And there's 12 of them here. And I'm going to give everybody one of these complimentary notepads. And, you know, when you have someone that you feel like you want to compliment somebody's doing something good that, that, that you see, um, you know, write it down and, and then give it to them. So write down, say, uh, Marlon, I really appreciate how you have given yourself to helping this church by driving people when you can, by coming and volunteering in the food pantry and, and helping out with, with, with what you can there. Or I'll say, Walter, I really appreciate how you have taken on being the usher. And, and, and you don't always have other ushers to help you, but, but you do. You take it on and you show up. And even today, when you didn't have a ride here, you found a way to get here. Okay, all right. When you found a way to get here, and I'll write down, Walter, I appreciate your service as an usher. You do a great job and welcome people to Rising Hope. And then I'll tear it off and I'll give you the form. If you can do, there's 12 of these in here. Do a positive compliment to somebody once a week. 
once a week, 12 weeks, that's going to get us up through the end of the year to the 1st of January. If we compliment somebody, one person, once a week, give them that complimentary note, let's see what a difference it makes in your life and makes in the life of Rising Hope. Now, for every note, there's a white page and there's a yellow page. Make sure you put the top sheet under the yellow page, because the yellow page is a record, a carbon copy of the person that you complimented. So uh, you can save that compliment that you gave to somebody. And, and this, it says here, and you can save it, and then we have a record. And then when we come back in 12 weeks, well, I hope you come back every week. <laughs> at the beginning of January, we can look at these, and you might want to share. What are some of the people you complimented, and, and, and did you get any result from that? And you can be complimenting people in church. You can be complimenting people outside of church. Complimenting people in your home, complimenting people on the streets. What is it? What will what will that result be? I feel if we are really honest in our complimenting people, we're going to have a packed house come January first because people are going to see this is a good place. This is a place where people uh, are accepting and loving. This this complimentary pad says. Jesus said, I proclaim the good news of the kingdom to other cities. Luke 4, 43. Rising Hope United Methodist Mission Church participates in Jesus' mission by proclaiming the good news with complimentary notes. Awesome. Complimentary notes are a way of our saying, God's got something good in store for you. First of all, I want you to know God loves you. God cares about you. So I want you to know that I see that. I see the good in you. So Barbara, help me pass these out. Let's, uh, Jackie, if you can help pass some out over this way, and Barbara can start on that side. And, uh, you know, take a look at it. I think I've got more here if we need it. Um, and, you know, think about it. Think about today. Uh, before you leave, think about who you would like to compliment. Write their name on that note if you know it. You may want to compliment somebody you see in the store that you don't know. But you saw this young boy, say for instance, talking to an older woman. And she was having trouble trying to figure out uh, uh, what to do in the store. And he just gave her some helpful guidance. You might want to write down, I've noticed how you talk to that woman. And you were very caring towards her. And then uh, you can sign your name if you want. You don't have to. But tear it off and then give it to the person in the store. Or give it to somebody on the job. Give it to somebody at home. Give it to somebody on the streets. Give it to somebody else in church. But I want us to fill these complimentary notepads out. And come January, we'll get back together. And we'll see, you know, what the results are. Did you have any surprising responses? Any wonderful responses? Are there any questions? You got one that was filled out? Okay, all right. That was the that was the one I did already. Okay. <laughs> All right. Are there any questions? Well, let's just start showing appreciation and gratitude towards one another. Um, I have been inspired the more I look at gratitude because it makes me realize the more wonderful things in life there really are and how grateful I am for each of you uh, 
for what you bring to the life of this congregation. Let's build, let's build on what God is doing here um, and realize that we have a wonderful, wonderful God and that gratitude causes us to shout to the Lord, shout to the Lord, uh, because really there is none like Him. Stand as you are able and we are going to 